my name is sahil and i welcome you all at an academy so guys in this session we take the most important articles from different newspaper different government publications and use them for our upsc csc examination so in the today's session we are going to cover two important sources that is indian express pib and these four articles we are going to cover first article is what should government do to correct worsening nutrient imbalance which is going to be a very important article for gs paper number 3 agriculture then we are going to see ganga vilas which has recently been launched by the government then pravasi bhartiya divas which is being observed now and green bonds which will be uh, which will be announced by the reserve bank of india now let's start a discussion on all these articles one by one now the first article that we are going to take is nutrient imbalance in india's agriculture what is nutrient imbalance why this nutrient imbalance is there now what are government initiatives in past and what are way forward in this direction we will cover all these dimensions here now first of all we have seen this particular thing that nutrient uh, basically in terms of the fertilizers that are used urea is one which is used in most quantities and a lot of urea is imported but because of russia ukraine war that was going on supply chain constraints came and urea prices increased because of that a lot of burden was imposed on government in the terms of the subsidy bill of fertilizers but now prices are getting relaxed relaxed secondly lockdowns in many of the countries have now been eased so we see that the fertilizer price have come under a control but there is inherent defect in india's subsidy policy now let's understand that particular thing but before that we'll be taking up some of the basic information so guys there are micro and macro nutrients that are needed by the crops for example there are 20 mineral elements that are necessary for beneficial growth out of the most important minerals carbon hydrogen out of the most important minerals for example carbon hydrogen oxygen they are supplied by air and water but there are other macronutrients and out of the macronutrients six macronutrients are the most important for plants growth and these are nitrogen phosphorus potassium calcium magnesium and sulfur which are needed now often soil is not capable often sometimes certain types of soils are not capable to provide all the nutrients in the adequate quantity that is needed by a plant by a crop so therefore we supply the nutrient from fertilizers and therefore the role of fertilizers come now apart from these six macronutrients some important micronutrients also that are needed in trace quantities they include boron chlorine copper iron fine manganese sodium zinc and you can see them on the screen now when we talk about fertilizer what is a fertilizer so fertilizer is a natural occurring substance it could be a natural occurring substance it could be an artificial substance which had desirable desirable amounts of chemical elements desirable amount of these macronutrients that are needed for the healthy growth of plant okay now when we talk about fertilizer sector of india three fertilizers which are used in most quantities are number 1 urea number 2 diammonium phosphate which is popularly called as dap and number 3 is muriate of potash mop so these are the three fertilizers which are most common which are most used in india and out of these three if i tell you urea is the one which is most used fine nitrogen plays now urea fine majority of basically the chemical component in urea is a nitrogen which plays a very important role in plant growth now if i give you relative size of india's fertilizer sector so india is the second biggest consumer of fertilizer in the world after china and fertilizer market in india right now is around 28 billion us dollar it was data in 2022 and it's going to increase and a compound annual growth rate of around 6% will be registered by 2028 so india's fertilizer sector is a very big one now coming to urea so i've told you that urea is the most important uh, the most important it's most produced it's most consumed and the most imported because we uh, our basic uh, our basic uh, the industries our indigenous industries are often not sufficient to provide the adequate quantities of urea so we import it 
Now, at the same time, it is most physically controlled fertilizer. Okay, and biggest chunk of subsidy that government is giving on fertilizer, it goes on one fertilizer that's urea. So out of total subsidy, 70% of subsidy of fertilizer is going to urea. Okay, now when we talk about urea guys, basically center pays a subsidy on urea where prices have been controlled by the government, maximum retail prices have been controlled. Now, what this particular arrangement looks actually on the ground, I'll just give you one kind of an idea. For example, manufacturing cost, let's say manufacturing cost of urea is 500 rupees. Now, government will provide that you need to retail or you need to sell urea to farmer at just 200 rupees. You cannot sell beyond 200 rupees. So, basically the gap, for example, 300 rupees, it will be paid by government directly to the manufacturer. So, this is the way in which subsidy at urea is operating. Now, so when we talk about urea guys, fine, uh, there is urea, fine, which is most controlled and then there are known urea fertilizers to other fertilizers that I have shown you in the start of the slide, that is DAP, okay, and MOP. Now, when we talk about the MRP, MRP of non-urea fertilizers are decontrolled. So, MRPs are decontrolled. Now, what government has come? Actually, for urea, the prices have been controlled. And for non-urea fertilizers, government is running a separate scheme that is nutrient-based subsidy scheme. Nutrient-based subsidy scheme. Now, what happens in nutrient-based subsidy scheme? Basically, guys, in nutrient-based subsidy scheme, for example, DAP, you take DAP, you take MOP. Now in DOP, DAP, for example, whatever, whatever nutrients are there, on the amount of nutrient, a particular, a particular subsidy will be announced and only that subsidy will be given. Here, the companies, the fertilizer companies, when they are selling DAP and MOP, they can sell them at a particular price. Government will not bring a price cap. But the amount of nutrient that is there, on that particular amount, government will announce a subsidy and on that level, subsidies will be given. So, they are actually decontrolled and they come under nutrient-based subsidy scheme. Now, what has happened here, guys, that when we talk about right now, there are price imbalances that are going on, fine? Basically, a lot of subsidy, I told you, is being given on urea. Urea subsidy accounts for around 70% and then after the urea, subsidy on DAP is highest and as subsidy on urea is highest, DAP is highest, automatically it means that they will be most affordable by the farmer. And as they are most affordable by farmer, what farmer is doing, farmer is utilizing, using indiscriminately these two fertilizers that's urea and DAP. Because of, because they are being, because they are highly subsidized, the prices of other fertilizers, they look expensive and farmer uses it. Because of this particular thing, guys, what has happened? Number one, number one, government has to borne a lot of subsidy cost on that particular front. And secondly, what's happening, this, there is imbalance of nutrient that in our soil has happened. Now, basically, it's recommended that nutrient in proportion of 4 is to 2 is to 1 should be applied. For example, nitrogen, phosphorus, okay. Okay, so there is a spelling mistake. It's not prosperous. It is phosphorus, okay. Nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. Nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, these three nutrients, they are to be applied in proportion of 4 is to 2 is to 1. But what's happening? Basically, nitrogen, urea, it's most cheapest. So, many number of times we find the proportion is something like this, where we find this thing, proportion is something like this, 36 is to 4 is to 1 or something like this, fine. So, basically nutrient balance of our soils have been disturbed. Moreover, when excessive usage of nitrogen is there, it also leads to toxicity of soil. And as farmers are procuring more and more urea, simply because it is cheap because of subsidy, but government has to pay subsidy. It's imposing burden, fiscal burden on government, okay? Now, it has implication on soil health. It ultimately be impacting the crop productivity as well.
Now, if I give you that how much fiscal burden is being imposed by it, you see this particular thing, that fertilizer subsidy is the second highest subsidy in India, the biggest subsidy that we give is on food and after food, second biggest subsidy is being given to fertilizer and it constitutes around 5% of our GDP, 5% of our GDP, it means it's the burden is huge. At the same time, the farmers are now, many small farmers are not able to derive its benefit. Small farmers, marginal farmers, they are not able to procure subsidized urea. Big and rich farmers are most of the time taking the most of the benefit of it. So, we need to reform this entire situation. Now, as we talk about the reform, I already have given you that government had tried to bring reform in some limited capacity and there, government came out with nutrient-based subsidy scheme already we have discussed. So basically, nutrient-based subsidy scheme was introduced in 2010, where government provided that on a per kg, on, on uh, government fixed a per kg NBS rate for each nutrient. Now, suppose you are making X fertilizer. In that X fertilizer, what is nitrogen? Okay, what is phosphorus? What is potassium? Okay, on that particular basis, the amount of nutrient that is there in a particular fertilizer, on that a particular rate will be announced and subsidy will be given. This was one particular way by which government tried to ease the subsidy burden. Okay, so prices are not fixed. Fine. On nutritional aspect, the price subsidy will be given. Next, government also came out with an innovative process, an innovative phenomena that is neem coating of urea. Neem coating of urea. Now, what is this issue? Understand this particular thing. That in past, now when we talk about the nitrogen, fine, urea. Now, nitrogen or the urea, it has usages in some other kind of industries also. For example, it has non-agricultural usage in plywood industries, in dyes, in cattle feed, in synthetic milk processing. There is also the use of the nitrogen. Now, many number of times, urea was being procured in the name of agriculture, but that urea was being used for industrial purposes. So, to avoid that thing, government introduced neem-coated urea. Now, this neem-coated urea cannot be used for industrial purposes. So, the diversion of subsidized urea that was happening, it came down. So, government had come out with that. Moreover, when we talk about the neem-coated urea, it also acts as a mild nitrification inhibitor. What it means? It means that it releases nitrogen over a prolonged period of time. Okay, over a prolonged period of time, nitrogen is released if it is coated by the neem oil. So, this is something that government has tried to bring. Now, when we talk about the present times, as I have told you, that global fertilizer prices have came down, it has eased. So, it's bringing certain opportunities for India. For example, it improves the overall availability. Now, actually, prices have got controlled and shortages of fertilizer that was there, it also had been uh, had been re reduced, which has re reduced the burden of fertilizer shortage that was there earlier. In present Rabi season, fertilizer shortage was not there. Second thing, we see this particular thing, that as uh, basically, uh, uh, as the, there was the geopolitical supply shocks that were there, which was making the supplies erratic, it has been introduced, okay, and moreover, as prices have come down, subsidy that we are giving is also come down, how? Now, understand this particular thing. So, I told you that particularly for urea, government had controlled the maximum retail price. Now, government will charge 200 rupees per kg. Now, if imports are coming expensive, let's say earlier imports were 500, government has to pay 300 rupees gap. Now, if let's say imports are coming at 700 rupees, government has to pay 500 rupees gap. So, basically subsidy is being reduced as geopolitical uncertainty reduced, which finally reduced the prices. Moreover, uh, basically it also has augmented fertilizer ability, okay, and this particular thing has helped in improving the net sown area under Rabi crops next season when the harvest of the rabi crop will be done we'll find this particular thing that it will also be providing the better agricultural productivity so that is all guys about this particular article i hope that you have understood all these particular issues and now moving to a mains practice question which can be asked on this particular line so question can be asked in gs paper number three for example critically analyze the performance of fertilizer subsidies given by government suggest measures needed to reform the industry Okay, so that is all about this particular article and guys before moving, I would like to tell you about Unacademy UPSC CSC GS courses. 
so why to join an academy because you have the most important reasons number one widest choice of educators flexibility to change your courses unlimited views on lectures dedicated doubt solving sessions printed notes end to end preparation mentorship daily answer writing and to get all these advantages you can join an academy's plus and iconic courses all these courses are available at flexible subscriptions you can take subscriptions of 12 month 18 month 24 month 36 months and you can learn at your own ease now all these subscriptions are available at a flat 10% discount if you use code sahil29 fine now the rmb batch is starting so rmb batch is going to start from january 12 which will be a english batch and dedicated focus will be given on prelims 2024 and you get here india's top educators then raftar batch is also going to start so raftar batch has started from 5th of january which is also the english batch now here also the focus will be on comprehensive coverage and again you get the india's top educators in this batch as well moreover all these courses are available at zero percent emi you can contact at this number and my team will guide you with the bare minimum formalities that are that are there moving on now taking up the next article so this article guys we have taken from pib okay and this team has been launched by ministry of ports shipping and waterways now government has recently announced ganga vilas now what is this ganga vilas Ganga Vilas is world's longest river cruise that has been started and this world's longest river cruise will unlock river cruise tourism in India which can provide a lot of economic opportunities. Now first of all Ganga Vilas this is world's longest river cruise it has been launched in Varanasi it will be a luxury cruise that will be covering a distance of 3200 kilometer it will cover 27 river systems in five states and even it will be covering the India and certain stretches of Bangladesh. So this is Ganga Vilas that has been launched. Now it will, in, it will start a new age of river cruise tourism. Now we'll discuss little bit about the river cruise tourism, what are the possibilities, what are opportunities in this particular sector. But here I would like to link this, uh, uh, this Ganga Vilas project with earth ganga now guys when we talk about earth ganga under the namami gange project the prime minister has also initiated earth ganga what is earth ganga earth ganga means that how ganga river basin can contribute in economy of the region these opportunities these possibilities have to be explored now understand this particular thing earth ganga focuses on sustainable development of ganga river sustainable development of surroundings of the Ganga river and at the same time by focusing on sustainable development of Ganga river and its basin economic activities related to the river Ganga are needed to be enhanced. So this is the concept of earth Ganga. If we talk about earth Ganga it has been provided that basically Ganga the earth Ganga model can contribute 3% of India's GDP from Ganga basin itself. So Ganga basin activities in Ganga basin can contribute to 3% of GDP. So the, here the river tourism, river cruise tourism that we are talking about will help us to achieve the uh, vision of earth Ganga. Now under earth Ganga government actually has uh, taken six pillars okay what are these six pillars very important for examination number one zero budget natural farming will be there zero budget natural farming where minimal use of fertilizer minimal use of chemical substances will be there it will help in promotion of organic agriculture in india second livelihood generation opportunities so people living in ganga basin they can be given many livelihood okay they can involve in uh, basically blue economic blue economy they can involve in tourism they can involve in service sector which will cater to tourism then promote the cultural heritage of tourism of ganga okay then next monetization and reuse of sludge and wastewater so around ganga many industries have also been operating so these industries are dumping a lot of waste so how that waste can be reused how the sludge can be reused for that particular thing we can start many projects increase public participation by increasing synergies between stakeholders so public is to be brought fine public need to be sensitized as how ganga river can be used sustainably 
fine it's a responsible management for that awareness needs to be increased public participation needs to be increased empowering local administration for improved voter water governance so ganga river has been called as annapurna why because ganga river nourishes nourishes by the water that it's providing so water governance sustainable use of water on that particular thing we also need to establish some viable models now as we talk about river ganga now river ganga it includes multiple perennial rivers and non perennial rivers okay perennial rivers and non perennial rivers fine now the ganga river is the biggest river system in india and this river system extends to along with india to bangladesh nepal and it certain regions of the tibet as well in india it covers the delhi madhya pradesh Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, West Bengal, Bihar, Jharkhand, Haryana, Himachal Pradesh, and Chhattisgarh. Guys, I am not talking about Ganga River. I am not talking about Ganga uh, only Ganga River. We are talking about the Ganga River system. So please keep it on mind. We are talking about Ganga River system, which includes the basin tributaries and other uh, rivers associated with it. Now, what is importance of development of Ganga Basin? Now. Basically, half of the Indian population lives around the river Ganga. We know this thing. Uttar Pradesh and Bihar are the two most populous regions. Okay, and as it falls in vicinity of the Ganga River system, so almost half of India's population lives here. Next, we find this particular thing that inland waterways. Fine, inland waterways. We have national waterways. In the national waterways, the national waterway number one is on the Ganga River. So inland waterways, they can play a very important role in economic activities, in sustainable transportation. Today, when we talk about inland waterways, they are also helping in utilizing the potential of cruise, cruise water, uh, cruise tourism. This particular region supports large percentage of farmers also. Okay, it's also one of the most fertile fertile tracts of agriculture, not only in India but the entire world. Then. wildlife preserve, uh, preservation endangered species let like gangetic river dolphin they depend on river ganga's ecological health so therefore we need to so we need to ensure that development of ganga river basin should be there but it should happen in sustainable way sustainable manner now how tourism can play an important role so tourism plays a very important role for example it helps in recognition of india's historical and cultural sites so many of historical sites cultural sites and natural sites which have not been explored till now they can be explored second when we focus on tourism regional development happens government focuses on building utility services there okay and as a particular place will be generating economic resources okay investors will be coming in that region will develop okay that entire region then social equality so equitable growth can be promoted certain areas have lagged behind because industrial base did not developed there but now they can also develop by tourism fine it helps in growth of our service sector particular tourism and hospitality and also infrastructure development so expansion of tourism industry will bring civic amenities will bring other supporting infrastructure and therefore infrastructure development will also be supported in this particular direction okay now ganga vilas that we have just launched it will help in number 1 generation employment generation so it will devil generate a lot of job for tour operators hospitality hospitality industry moreover it will also enhance the soft power of india now as the tourist will come and they'll explore the ganga vilas india you see this particular thing that we have deployed longest river cruise okay so by this particular thing india is further demonstrating a special soft power okay and by tourism anyhow the soft power of india will be promoted moreover river cruise tourism as i have talked about it is very important now it economically plays a significant role for example global river cru uh, cruise market it is growing at the rate of around 5% over last few years and it will constitute around 37% of cruise market so total cruise market okay it will include seas it will include backwaters and in include rivers so river fine con will constitute 37% of total cruise market and when we talk about the cruise market we see this particular thing europe has been driving europe is deriving a major share 60% of river cruise vessel 60% share of river cruise vessel it's in europe so therefore india can also take the advantage here now when we talk about india india has tried to 
and uh, india has tried to reap benefit out of the rivers tourism potential many activities we have developed on the rivers and river fronts for example for example we see this particular thing that already eight river cruise vessels already eight river cruise vessels are operational fine between kolkata and varanasi and when we talk about river cruise it's also operational on national waterway number 2 brahmaputra river now along with along with the tourism along with the cruise activities other tourism for tourism for example river rafting camping along the river banks sightseeing kayaking there are certain activities that we have explored but now cruise tourism is something that we need to focus more and it will be helped by ganga vilas now i already told you that on national waterway number 2 there are river cruise that are also operational now however this particular sector has certain challenges number 1 this sector is seasonal i told you many rivers are non perennial non perennial means that the water flow minimal flow will reduce when it's a dry season okay so these rivers are not fit for developing cruise tourism then next is high taxes on travel and tourism which often makes the industry uncompetitive then lack of basic sanitation facility basic infrastructure the tourist needs often on the ghats which will be the points where they can stop basic facilities are not there then natural disasters for example himalayan rivers many of them are they are prone to flooding okay they are prone the many number of times the rivers they are basically other geographical phenomena such as cloud bursts etc they increase the water flow in the rivers in the sudden time which often makes the rivers un basically the stability of cruise tourism will be challenged there and not only cruise tourism but other types of tourism will also be all other type of activities will also be challenged then unsustainable practices by tourist often tourist they involve in garbage dumping find they degrade the natural ecology of that region they contaminate the water sources okay because of irresponsible behavior so these are certain challenges that will be imposed okay at the same time there is lack of skill sets also find guides many number of times they are not very much trained in terms of the languages promotion and marketing of our india's cruise sector has not been sufficient okay now guys these are some other schemes that we are running for development of river ganga fine you can just see that ganga action plan national river ganga basin authority namami gange program okay national clean ganga fund ganga utsav where ministry of jal shakti fine is collaborating with national mission for clean ganga okay and it is organizing the public river connection okay public river people are being sensitized people are being aware fine so ganga action plan national river ganga basin authority and Nam namami gange pro program particularly focuses on cleaning of the river ganga okay now on this particular ask question uh, on this particular topic also mains practice question could be asked for example what is earth ganga model how is it different from earlier approaches in development of ganga basin fine now moving to next article okay so basically guys now pravasi bhartiya divas convention is being observed and when we talk about the pravasi bhartiya divas let's know little bit about pravasi bhartiya divas because it is a very important topic for our prelims examination now first of all what is pravasi bhartiya divas why pravasi bhartiya divas is observed so basically 9th january okay so today is 9th january okay and 9th january is officially celebrated as a pravasi bhartiya divas because on this day 1915 fine there was the return of mahatma gandhi who is the greatest pravasi of india he returned to india from south africa and to commemorate that particular day pravasi bhartiya divas is observed now pravasi bhartiya divas started in 2003 However, in 2015, Pravasi Bharatiya Divas got reformed. Earlier, it was an yearly occurrence, but now Pravasi Bharatiya Divas is observed every two years. Seventeenth Pravasi Bharatiya Divas Convention is being held in Indore. Okay, so these are certain facts for prelims examination that are important. Question can be asked. Now, we are observing the seventeenth edition of Pravasi Bharatiya Divas, and in this particular edition, what is the theme? Theme is diaspora reliable partners for india's progress in amrit kal okay now when we talk about diaspora diaspora these are the people of indian origin or the people of a particular the people who belong to one country but they are living in some other country 
So when we talk about Indian diaspora, Indian diaspora are the people who are Indians, native to India but are living in other countries, US, Germany, France, any other country. So they are the Indian diaspora. So these non-resident Indians, these diasporas are uh, these diasporas are appraised for the role that they have played. These diasporas achievements are appreciated and in the Pravasi Bharatiya Devas. And now we are observing it. Understand this particular thing that as we talk about Indian diaspora, India has the second largest diaspora in the world, around 25 million. And Indian diaspora includes non-resident Indians, non-resident Indians, non-resident Indians are the people who still hold Indian resident citizenship but are living in some other country as a usual place of their residence. Fine, their usual place of residence is some other country but still they are Indian citizens. And then there are persons of Indian origin. So persons of Indian origin are the ones who had the links with India. Okay, for example, your let's say a person's parents migrated to US. Okay, now their kids let's say have US citizenship, but their civilizational links are traced from India. So they are the people of Indian origin. Now, the diaspora plays a very important role. So therefore, so therefore, recognizing diaspora is important through these events such as Pravasi Bharti Divas is very important. What important role diaspora plays? Number one, diplomacy. So, diaspora helps in promoting India as a soft diplomacy. So, when we hear a very important and popular example is India-US nuclear deal, deal India-US civil nuclear agreement that was signed. So, their Indian diaspora actually lob lobbied, Indian diaspora lobbied US's Congress fine and there they played a very important role. So, for, for policy formation, the diasporas can help. Next, it can help in remittances. So, we see this particular thing guys that basically India is facing current account deficit year over year. Current account deficit is a very big issue. Now, their diaspora are sending remittances and India is one of the biggest recipient of remittances. So, therefore, in reducing the pressure on CAD, these remittances are helping. They are the source of trade and investment in India. Now, when we talk about Indian diaspora, Particularly diaspora living in North America and Western Europe is a very affluent diaspora which brings investments in India. And then it also helps in growth and development of resident nation. Okay, Silicon Valley fine has many Indian startups. So opportunities also they are able to avail there. Now, government is running many schemes for promoting Indian diaspora apart from Pravasi Bharti Divas. Fine, so first is Pravasi Bharti Divas anyhow that we have discussed here. Apart from it, Overseas Citizenship of India, okay, fine, so we have brought an amendment to Citizenship Act and Overseas Citizenship of India scheme is being provided where, uh, uh, where basically a hassle-free entry and exit is being provided to, uh, to, uh, to the overseas citizen in India. No India program, fine, where specifically programs have been started to generate awareness of the youth Indian diaspora. So the people who the second generation, third generation diaspora living in other countries, they often don't know about Indian culture. They are not able to connect with the Indian culture. So to sensitize, aware them, then Pravasi Kaushal Vikas Yojana for the skill development and Madad Portal. So Madad Portal is to provide timely help, fine, to the people who are living abroad. Okay, if they are having some grievances, some problems, their grievances, problems can be addressed by the Madad Portal. Okay, now there are certain challenges also that Indian diaspora is now facing. Number one, anti-globalization right now. So around the world, anti-globalization, de-globalization, decoupling is going on. Because of that particular thing, often the backlashes, hate speeches, hate crimes are being faced. Fine, terrorist activities in Middle Eastern nation. They are certain significant challenges to Indian diaspora. Apart from them, employment threat is there. Often, basically it has been found that the local people are being given the first preference for employment and ill treatment, harassment, Okay, discriminations. These are big problems that Indian diaspora has often faced. Okay, so guys, with this, you can write any answer on diaspora. All the dimensions of Indian diaspora, which is directly mentioned in your GS paper number two, we have covered. Now, mains practice question. Indian diaspora act like a bridge between their resident nation and Indian promoting and India promoting simultaneous growth in both nations. Discuss. So it will be a 10 marker question on GS paper number two. You can write and you can practice writing it. Now, the next article again is from Indian Express newspaper, Green Bonds. Now, this particular article will see with respect to the prelims, Indian economy and GS paper number three, Indian economy. Okay. 
So first of all, what's the context? So Reserve Bank of India has announced that it will issue issue sovereign green bonds. There will be in two tranches, in two installments, sovereign, sovereign green bonds will be issued. First tranche will be a five-year bond. Uh, there will be, sorry, a five-year bond and a 10-year bond will be introduced in January and February. So in two tranches in January and February, green bonds, five-year bond and 10-year bond will be issued. Now, when we talk about the bonds, green bonds, what are these green bonds? So basically, guys, government raise a certain investment, sorry, government raise the finances, government raise the finances, which will specifically be used for environmentally sustainable infrastructure. Okay, for example, a solar power project is to be developed, a windmill has to be developed, a hydropower project is to be developed, or any of those projects which will be environmentally sustainable, which will be climate sensitive, these infrastructures will be developed, okay, and the money will be used on those projects. So these are the bonds that are issued by any sovereign entity government, fine, alliances, corporates, and money will go to the projects which are environmentally sustainable. Is it clear or not? Now, when we talk about sovereign gold, green bonds, sovereign green bonds, the framework scheme for issuing sovereign green bonds have been issued in 2022. Because, guys, we have we have taken multiple targets, for example, under Intended Nationally Determined Contributions, INDC. In Paris, we have taken targets to reduce our carbon emission. COP26 in 2021 in Glasgow, we have taken the target of achieving carbon neutrality by 2070. So in order to in, in order to fulfill India's carbon pledges, India's environmental targets, we often initiate the green projects and for that financing is brought. So it's critical to connect environmental projects with capital markets. Investors can directly invest, okay? The environmentally sensitive investors can directly invest. So we try to connect with them. It channels the capital towards the sustainable development. Now, basically investors, they can get an advantage. For example, okay, investors through these uh, green bonds get a platform to engage in good practices to finance the projects which are environmentally sustainable. It influences business strategy of bond issuers indirectly helps in, in disincentivizing high carbon emitting projects. Okay, so directly as money will go, High carbon emitting projects, polluting projects will be disincentivized by the green bonds. Now, India will be helped on multiple fronts by these green bonds. For example, I already told you India's climate commitment. So, India has committed to reduce emission intensity of GDP by 45% by 2030. Okay, so emission intensity. So, basically, guys, at 2005 level, it is compared. So in 2005, whatever emissions we were doing, we will reduce our emissions from 2005 to 45%. Okay, we'll, re we'll carry the reduction of 45% till 2030. And that comparison will be compared at 2005 level. This is a target under INDC that we have taken. We need to achieve 50% of our electricity through non fossil fuels, non fossil fuels fine through renewable sources. So these green bonds will help us in developing those in financing those particular projects. Then climate actions of governments, okay, it will help the Indian governments in tapping finances from potential investors. Now government's capacity to invest in these projects is limited. So government can tap an additional source of funding. Okay, so this is the benefits that will be there. Now, on this particular type of uh, uh, on this particular issue, there is one of question that we can take. Okay, the prelims question. Which of the following are part of India's national determined contributions? Number one, three statements are there. Improving the emission intensity of its GDP by 33 to 35%. Achieving net zero emission. Achieving 50% cumulative electricity, electric power installed. Three statements have been given. Try to mark your right option. You can pause the video. You can mark the right option. And the correct answer will be D. Okay. So these are guys all the dimensions related to this particular article. So with this, we come to an end to the today's video. Guys, I hope that you have liked it. If you have liked, please do subscribe to channel and please do hit the like button. Thank you so much.